Jesus to go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. This is what these shoeboxes are all about, going out in the heart of this darkness, the heart of this virus, to go out and to bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. Is there a sense of urgency? Yes, there is. Because there's kids out there without the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. Get out there to be a part of this. Right now, it's the time. Well, good morning. Um, uh, at the end of the summer, Peter delivered a sermon, uh, a, a series of sermons about COVID and how we can be productive as a body and what can we do um, as believers in such a crazy, uncertain time. And so putting our heads together of how do we get out in outreach uh, capacity to reach out to our community um, during this COVID crazy time where everyone is on the spectrum of how they feel about getting out in the community and not being able to. So one thing we thought we could do as a body that is unifying for us to do and really good is we're starting a new prayer initiative that you can do from the comfort of your own home. Um, but this is a very intentional way to be praying. And so every week, as we all know, Peter often prays for uh, countries and uh, leaders and churches. And so we're asking you to kind of join with that intentionally for the leader of the week, so to speak, that we want to be intentionally praying for this country that has been so fractured um, through politics and so many other things that regardless of whether they're believers, Republicans, Democrat is irrelevant. We're told to pray for our leaders. And so we want to be doing that intentionally and unifyingly as a body. And so every week when Peter is up here praying, um, we would like to ask you to join with that each week. So when he prays for a, a local or state leader, we're asking you to pray as well. Um, and just be praying for their wisdom, their well-being, um, whether policies are, you know, directly related to them of the week or not. You can do that or not. But as a body, that's something that we can do. So we would like you to be praying for that. And then, again, from the comfort of your own home, those of you that feel like it's hard for me to find ways to minister right now, what could I possibly do from home? We also want to intentionally be writing a handwritten letter. For those of you that are under 30, <laughs> that means not on the computer. So we want those of you that feel like handwriting is your gift, we would love for you to let um, uh, Kathy Roper know she's going to be leading the kind of the logistical component of this. We are organizing weekly who we're going to be praying for together and then asking for somebody weekly to be handwriting a letter to that person. And Kathy can help you find an address for the office of that person. And we want that person to know that we are praying for them, that it's nothing but positive from us, that we wish them well, we wish their families well. We're praying for wisdom for them and for God to be blessing them. And we just want them to know that there are churches in the community that are doing that for them and hoping that that's going to be an encouragement to them as well. So. For one, you can be praying through the week in your own devotional time for that. And two, if you are interested in being on a rotation where you can just be writing a handwritten letter, it does not have to be long. Um, it could be three sentences. It could be longer. It's up to you. So if that's something that you would like to do, get with Kathy Roper, or if you're not uh, sure how to get in touch with Kathy, but you know who I am, you're welcome to uh, find me as well, and I can put you in touch with Kathy. So I just want to be encouraging you to be considering that. We are going to be jump-starting that this week. So who Peter prays fit for from the pulpit, we would encourage you to do that too in terms of local leadership. And one last thing. In two weeks, um, we are going to be doing our lunch with the pastors, lunch with the elders um, outside. It is for all college students as well as if you are early in your careers. We want to encourage you to come. We're going to be outside. We're going to provide bagels and donuts and, and Peter <laughs> and the elders. And so we're inviting you to come and fellowship and stump him as best you can um, and just get to know us as a church a little bit more. And we would encourage you to invite friends because who doesn't like free lunch? So um, that will be in two weeks on November 1st. Okay, thanks.
right, let's just take a moment and uh, quiet our hearts as we seek God's blessing on our service this morning. This morning, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 2, which is the inauguration psalm. It's probably one of my favorite psalms. Um, And here it goes. We're going to read all of Psalm chapter 2. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he speaks. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What a great psalm this morning. Let's pray. Father, we are very aware this morning, Lord, that you are on your throne. And Father, we're gripped by that. And for those who follow you, for those who are believers in Christ, Lord, that is a great assurance for us because no matter what happens, no matter what this world can throw at us, our hope is in you and in you alone. So thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you, Lord, that for those that love you, for those that kiss the Son, Lord, our strength is in you, not in ourselves, not in our nation, not in this country, not in anything that this world has to offer. It is in you. So thank you for that reminder this morning in Psalm 2. And Father, I pray today as we study the text, as we proclaim truth, that the truth of your word would permeate our hearts, that the Spirit of God would be at work in us, conforming us, changing us, transforming us, renewing our minds so that we can be like you, so that we can grow in your grace that we desperately need. Every day of the week, we, we trample in this world, and we, and we believe, and we see things, Lord, that we shouldn't see, and we hear things that we shouldn't hear. And Lord, it affects us. It changes us for the worse. But God, we don't want that. We want your truth. So Lord, this morning, I pray that your truth would ring in our hearts, that we would be changed, that we would be encouraged, and Lord, that Christ Fellowship Church would be built up for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today our theme is justice and worship, so stand with me. Let's sing some songs about Christ, our King, both now and forever sitting on his throne. We'll start with crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark! The heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the 
breath of God show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth, cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our prayers And we go to him, in, uh, we, through him, in prayer to the Father. It's the Holy Spirit that intercedes for us. That's what we want to do now. Let's go to our God together in prayer, trusting the Holy Spirit to help us as we do so. Let's pray. Our fathers, we come into your presence this morning. We are mindful that we are only able to come because of the perfect life and substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're mindful that it is only through him that we have access to you. And we praise you this morning because it is your Holy Spirit who is at work in us. Lord, and even interceding for us now so that as we approach the very throne of grace, you hear us. You listen. And this amazing reality, you listen with favor and with a desire to hear and a desire to act and a desire to bless us far more than we desire to be blessed. Lord, we praise you for who you are this morning. We praise you as the God of justice. Lord, we're mindful in your word that all of your ways are just and right and good. And Lord, we especially praise you this morning because you have made a way to justify poor sinners like us through the perfect work of Jesus so that even now we appear before you clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Lord, in your eyes, by faith in Christ, we are just, we are righteous, and we are holy. And we praise you that that will never change about us from now on to all eternity because of Jesus. We are accepted in your sight. We praise you for that grace. And we praise you, Lord, for the help you give us by your spirit to live like who we are. Lord, you have made us just in Christ. You've made us righteous in Christ. And now you call us to live justly in this world. That we would be actively doing unto others as we'd have them do unto us. That we would be concerned for others caring for others, ministering to others, listening to others, blessing others. And all of it would just overflow out of our lives because that's what your spirit does. Your spirit fills us so that we can live in a way that makes much of Jesus and brings glory to you. Lord, when we think of your character, we confess that we are often unlike you. Lord, in many ways, we see this in our hearts. Instead of actively treating others the way we'd want to be treated, we're often only concerned about being served and having others treating us well, having our own agendas fulfilled. Time is so important to us, and so we don't make time for others, don't make time to care for others, don't make time to listen to others. Lord, because we just find ourselves trapped in this selfishness, which, which our souls hate, and yet the sin clings to us, and we confess it as sin. And we ask that you would teach us to love as you love. Lord, instead of caring about the life experiences of others in our community, we're often only concerned about our own experiences and our own needs. 
and ourselves being understood. Instead of actively pursuing to make our community better or even more just, we find it's easy for us to close our eyes to the sufferings of others or to make excuses for why they're experiencing what they're experiencing and for why it shouldn't really matter to us. And we've all done this, and we confess it as sin. And we pray, Lord, that you'd make us merciful as you are merciful. We thank you, Lord, that we have a living hope this morning. Lord, our hope is not in that we're going to see sin eradicated in this present dying world, but our hope is that there's a much better world to come, that we're headed towards that world. It's a world marked by perfect love and perfect justice. And so we thank you for the mission that you have given us as the people of God living in this world, that we are to live in this world as if we've already gone ahead to heaven, already gone ahead to that better world and seen the glory of it and see the love that defines it and the justice that defines it and the peace that defines it, and now come back and live in this world in that way so that we might, we might do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with you so that we might be salt and light. Lord, thank you for giving us that mission. Thank you that every moment of every day because of Jesus is deeply meaningful, deeply purposeful. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this, this great gift you've given us in salvation. Lord, we don't only pray for ourselves this morning. We pray for all the nations of the world. We've been reminded from Psalm 2 that you sit high above it all on a throne. And the nations rage, and certainly they're raging in our day. Certainly we're seeing turmoil and violence and tribulation. Lord, we're seeing famine. We're, we're seeing, Lord, broken individuals uh, in, such a, in such a uniquely clear way. And God, yet your world, this world, because of sin, has always been broken in this way. And Lord, so we know that sin affects all nations and all peoples. I want to pray this morning for the nation of Russia, 144 million people that have known just decades of government corruption and, Lord, much poverty and much suffering and much hopelessness. Lord, the promises of secularism and of communism did not come to pass. Instead, they brought pain. Lord, there's even persecution against your church there. No, oh, Father, it's a, it's a nation filled with people, men, women, boys and girls made in your image whom you love. Lord, and we pray this morning for this nation. We pray that you would help our brothers and sisters there to be bold. Uh, Lord, to live decidedly Christian lives, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to preach him and to share him, Lord, because he is the only hope in this world. I pray that you'd strengthen your church in Russia to that end, and I pray that you'd move across that nation and send revival to that nation. Lord, so that the leaders would rule in justice and not in injustice. And we pray, Father, that the end result would be that you would be glorified in the nation of Russia. Lord, we do. We want to be a church that prays for the leaders that you've placed over us. Lord, they are in such desperate need of your help. Lord, we pray this morning for our Senator, Mark Warner. Lord, we pray for him. Lord, we pray that you give him wisdom as he... Uh, leads our state along with Senator Tim Kaine. We pray, God, that you'd help them to um, support and even write and champion laws that honor you and do not dishonor you. Lord, more specifically, we pray for his soul. Lord, we know that it's a very serious thing to gain the whole world and yet lose your soul, and we pray that uh, Mr. Warner would not experience that, but instead you would surround him with believers who would be bold enough to share Christ with him, and we pray that he would trust in you and know you and love you Lord, we pray that you bless his family, bless his marriage, bless him as he parents. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd give him grace and that you'd help us to be mindful as a church to pray, to pray for him. Lord, he needs it, and we pray, God, that you'd bless him this morning. Father, we pray for other churches in our community, so we thank you for Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church and for Pastor Dennis Griffith. We pray, praise you for the, the reality that the gospel is proclaimed there. Lord, we thank you that that church is a church that loves the community. It's a church that loves the college and Lord, we're just asking that you would cause all grace to flow into that church. Lord, that as they preach your word, men and women and children would be built up, conformed to the very image of Christ. We pray that you would help uh, Pastor Griffith in particular to not grow weary in well-doing, but to know that in due time he will reap if he does not give up. So, Lord, strengthen him to that end, that he would be sustained and he would continue to run the race faithfully. And we thank you that he is. Lord, we pray for our own church this morning, and we thank you for the great gift of baby Jude Doan. Uh, thank you that Megan is doing well. Thank you that Jude is doing well. 
And we pray for Stephen and the, the Doan family as they kind of adjust now to this new reality as a, a family of five. We pray, God, for quick recovery for Megan and for Jude. And we pray for this little life, Lord, that you would hold Jude in your hands. And we pray that as a young age, he would just turn from his sins and trust in Jesus. And we would see that happen in our midst. What a joy that would be. And we pray for that. God, we ask that you would grant our church a culture of prayer. We pray that in individual ways and in corporate ways, you would help us to grow because prayer is the battle. And we're so prone to work and do and work and do, but we end up doing it in our own strength and not in the strength that you supply. And so very little eternally significant work can happen in that. But God, we want to be a people that are humble, that understand our need for you so that we would cry out, Lord, and you would hear our prayers and you would, you would just be pleased to make this church a holy, happy, joy-filled community that walks in love. We thank you for the way you're doing that. We pray that you would do it even more. And we thank you that all you want from us is thanksgiving and praise and prayer for more. What an amazing thing that you just want us to ask you for more grace and for more grace. So teach us to cry out for that in that way. Lord, we pray that we would be a church that does unto others what we would have them do unto us. We pray that we would be a church that's marked by justice. We pray that we'd be a church that's marked by love. We pray that we'd be a church that's marked by a selflessness and a love for others. And Lord, only you can produce that in us. So we pray that you would. And Lord, in just a, a, a minute, our brother, Pastor Tony Shepherd, is going to come and he's going to open your word to us. And God, we thank you for him. And we're asking even now that you would be filling him with your spirit so that as he speaks to us, you would just speak through him and we would be built up and encouraged and convicted and reproved and blessed and strengthened. And you would get all the glory for it. Thank you that you are able to do this. And you tell us that you do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we do have a unique privilege in the life of our church. Um, about 200 years ago, it's a very common thing for brother pastors in a community to uh, share pulpits and, and bless each other's churches. And that was, uh, that was just part of the way that the Lord would remind us that we're a part of something much bigger than ourselves. And there are other brothers and sisters, other faithful churches that are preaching the gospel in our community, and, and uh, Pastor Tony is a part of Hampton Roads Fellowship, along with Miguel Davila, where they um, began planting that church, I believe seven years ago now, uh, just about the same time that Christ Fellowship got going. And the Lord has done a good work there, and the Lord has sustained that work. And I've known Miguel and Tony really since the beginning of this journey together, and uh, he's a part of the lunch that we have each month. And, uh, and Tony just brings a wealth of wisdom and a wealth of humility uh, he's a faithful brother that teaches God's word well, so we're very grateful that he would come. We're very grateful to his wife, Jolene, that she would allow him to come and be here and serve us in this way, uh, because she has six of their children with her this morning, and she's caring for all six of those children this morning so that her husband could be here with us. So, you know, praise God for that. And Tony, please come minister God's word to us this morning. We're very grateful for you and look forward to hearing what God has for us through you this morning. All right. Well, good morning, Christ Fellowship. Good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Peter, for the uh, great welcome, and uh, definitely thank you to my wife, uh, who is uh, lovingly holding down uh, the fort uh, as I'm here with you all today. Um, I want to begin by reading uh, the text. Uh, the text will come from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 7. And this is the word of the Lord. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, 
He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, family, thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to share God's word uh, with you today. Um, I still remember the first time that I met uh, Peter some years ago. It was in Washington, D.C., I believe, at uh, Capitol Hill Baptist Church. It was a luncheon. Uh, Me and a few others were sitting around a table. And uh, as we began to talk about ministry and things like that, uh, we began to realize, hey, we're all from the same area of Virginia. And at the time, I thought it was, man, what a, what a chance that we would just so happen to be sitting at the, the same table. I later on realized that it was a, a Mark Dever-level intentionality uh, that was putting us together at the same table so that we would build relationships with those fellow pastors that were uh, in the area. And I'm grateful for the friendship uh, that I have with Peter and also just the partnership in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Uh, HRF sends her warm greetings uh, to you all here. Um, Lately, uh, we as a church, uh, we have been preaching through a few sermons and a short sermon series on the topic of biblical uh, justice. And we know just as a country, we are living in some very interesting times, um, tense, turbulent times. Um, You know, there's a pandemic, there's political tensions, there are racial tensions, all of these things happening around us. And there's a lot of talk about justice these days, and rightly so. Who does not want to live in a just society? And more than anyone else on planet Earth, Christians should care about justice and about doing justice. But here's the thing. What the world says about justice and what God says about justice are two radically different things. According to the Bible... Justice is not ultimately about social issues. It's not ultimately about earthly politics either. According to the Bible, justice is more fundamentally about worship. Worship. Now, something that caught my attention as I was kind of browsing through Christ Fellowship's uh, website uh, was your vision statement. I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful vision statement. Here is what it says, and I quote, Spreading a passion... For the worship of God in all of life, in Williamsburg, in our nation, and among the nations. Now, family, that is a beautiful vision statement because it's a very biblical vision statement. Uh, The goal of redemption, as you trace the Bible from beginning to the end, the goal of redemption is worship. Right, the climax of all redemptive history in the book of Revelation ends with the worship of God in the adoration of God in Christ Jesus. So this vision statement really resonates with me. I believe it resonates with every believer who has the Spirit within them. And today, I want us to see how the Bible connects this idea of worship with the concept of biblical Justice. So the title of the sermon today is simply Justice and Worship. The world today is not the just society that God calls it to be or that it will one day be. But my bottom line is this. The justice problems 
that humanity faces today actually reveal the worship problems that humanity has in the heart. And that means the answer we ultimately need for the trouble in our world today is God himself. God himself. The fantastic news today is that God has a solution, and his solution is way better, way bigger than anything else that we can come up with in our own human imagination. God's solution actually transforms us. God's solution is actually working today. God's solution promises to make all things right one day. And the church today, the living body of Christ, actually participates in the work that God is doing in the world for his glory. So I want to give us three points today as we walk through uh, this text. Uh, The first point is that doing justice is a worship issue. That will be the first point. The second is that doing justice is God's work. And the third point is that doing justice is our work. So let's roll through the book of Isaiah and see how we flesh this out. So the first point, doing justice uh, is a worship issue. Now, this topic of justice and the practice of doing justice has way more to do with worship than we realize. Um, The world's talking about justice Uh, And it can kind of give the impression that justice has more to do with kind of social media, uh, maybe politics, race, or even just religiosity. But my my point here is that doing justice is actually a worship issue. It's a God issue. Uh, The Bible says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. That's Psalm 89, 14, right? So righteousness is how God rules. Justice is how God rules. So we cannot have a conversation about justice without first asking the question, where is God in all of this? Uh, I'll put it another way. Behind every kind of injustice that we see in the world is at some level the fruit of rejecting God and his righteous rule over us. Injustice and rebellion go hand in hand. So this is why I say that justice is not mainly a political issue or a social issue. It's actually a worship issue. And this idea really cuts through in the book of Isaiah. So even before we jump into Isaiah 42, uh, my first point is all about the context of Isaiah. Uh, The first 39 chapters of Isaiah... Uh, are are all about, mainly, they major on this theme of God's judgment on Israel because of her idolatry and her injustice. So so once upon a time, we think of the story of the Bible, uh, Israel was in bondage. They were in Egypt. But God, the Holy Redeemer, he redeems her out of bondage in order to make her into a nation, a nation that would worship him and him alone. Right? This is the entire point of their rescue. God chooses them. He calls them out of Egypt. He gives them laws to guide their worship and to shape their society. And the big part of their worship, if you go back to like Leviticus chapter 19, uh, you'll see that a big part of their worship, including love for neighbor, right? Especially the neighbors that were vulnerable in their midst. So there's kind of the the quartet of uh, the vulnerable that we see in the Old Testament, often the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the sojourner. We see them featured uh, very frequently in the Old Testament. And so long as Israel walked humbly with their God and loved their neighbor, they were to be a picture of redemption and a means of spreading God's peace and blessings to the nations. All right, so this is the setup. But as we read the story of the Bible, we continue on, it did not take long for the nation to grow cold in their love for God and in their love for their neighbor. As a whole, this nation turns away from their devotion to God. So instead of bearing the fruit of righteousness, they began to bear the bitter grapes of rebellion and corruption and injustice. So the holy city, Zion, was no longer shining her beautiful light for the nations to see. 
And by the time we get to the book of Isaiah, they're really at a low point here. So God calls the prophet Isaiah to warn about the coming judgment. And this goes on for the first 39 or so chapters of Isaiah. The nation was in rebellion against God, and the fruit of that rebellion was a major breakdown in justice in society. So Isaiah 1 opens like this. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkeys its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have utterly, are utterly estranged. And Isaiah goes on in verse 16 in chapter 1. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. How the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Family, this was the situation ancient Israel was facing. They were once a people known for righteousness and justice. There was a time, Isaiah says, that the city was full of justice. Righteousness had her zip code among them, lodged in them. But because of their rebellion against God, all of that was changing. Now evil was rampant. They didn't protect the vulnerable. They perverted justice. They abused their power. They made friends with thieves. They were drunk with power and pleasure and trampling over people left and right. This is a very, very dark picture, Isaiah chapter 1. This chapter details the idolatry and the rebellion that was gripping Jerusalem and the corruption in society that was resulting from it. So Isaiah is speaking out against this. And the same dynamic holds true in every society. Wherever the worship of God is not at the center, idolatry will take its place. So if you're a secular society rejecting the worship of God, you will eventually drift into creating a society of injustice. The shocker here in Isaiah is that you can even be a religious society and miss the mark even more. Jerusalem was a very religious city, but their religion was a form of hypocrisy. So God says in Isaiah 1, verse 11, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. Right? They were a very religious city. But God was not at the center of their worship. And the result was not only idolatry, but an unjust society. And this makes sense because what are our idols? What are they really? Uh, Every idol is a slave master in disguise, right? What can idols really do for us? They can't save you. They're powerless. All of our idols, all they can do for us is demand, Right? They demand, they promise life, but then they let you down. Right? They suck the life out of us, and then they crush us. And what kind of society flows out of that? A society that crushes people around. A society that sucks the life out of others. A society that uses people. Right? Greed is an idol that leads to societal injustice. Demand for comfort can become an idol that leads to injustice. Pride an idol that leads to injustice. Anything can become an idol in every society that tries to build its identity around idols will inadvertently build a society where people, especially the vulnerable, are crushed under the weight of those idols. Racism, abortion, 
redlining, police brutality, rioting, kickbacks, bribes, all of these things flow out of our idols. Now, this does not mean that every culture is as bad as it could be or that there is no goodness in any human culture at all. It only means that we have a problem that is so much deeper than what earthly politics or even religion can offer us. Justice is a worship issue, and that means the solution must be deeper than simply getting religious or getting political. We have to admit that the problem is much bigger than that. Israel could not save itself. They had God's law. They had the prophets. They had miracles. They had the covenants. They had a religious form of governments. They had the holy city, Zion. They had everything, and still they could not prevent corruption by their own power. Now, that doesn't mean that we sit back and we do nothing or that we're just hopeless, right? But it does mean that our first step is always to humble ourselves to God's way out. The failure of Israel is a reminder that every society needs divine intervention. We cannot bring the justice we deeply long for, but God has a way out. And this is exactly where Isaiah is going. Idolatry and injustice are not the end of the story in Isaiah. Right? God does not leave us there, but he takes us further on to hope. And this brings me to the second point and to our text in Isaiah 42. Doing justice is God's work. So I mentioned that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah majors on this theme of judgment. But from chapters 40 on, uh, there's this sudden shift from judgment to hope. Family, God is not in the business of leaving us hopeless. He is not in that business. Uh, God is in the business of giving us strong hope, living hope. And he does it by turning our eyes away from the problem and turning our attention to his solution. So look at verses 1 through 4 in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law." Family, this is a beautiful picture of hope in the midst of darkness here. Right? There was chaos in their society. There was idolatry. Uh, there was confusion. There was injustice. There was judgment. There was despair. There was hopelessness. And right in the middle of that, God quiets the storm and he says, look here. Put your attention here. You see that word, behold? Behold. I want to show you where to put your hope. God is saying, behold, my servant. This is a call to worship. Behold, my servant. And what follows is a description of the perfect spirit-filled servant who brings justice to God's world. He would come and right every wrong and establish righteousness on earth. The servant here is none other than Jesus Christ. Um, In Luke 4, Jesus stood in the synagogue in his hometown, uh, Nazareth. Uh, He unrolls the scroll of Isaiah. And he announced that on this day, he was, in fact, the fulfillment of this spirit-filled servant of Isaiah who brings this perfect justice. And we should just really marvel at this picture. Everything that's wrong in our world between God and man and man and man, Jesus came to deal with these issues. The picture we see here is a picture of commitment to justice, commitment to righteousness, commitment to restoring everything that was destroyed by our sin and our rebellion. Behold my servant. He is God's chosen servant to bring about justice on earth. He is God's spirit-filled anointed one. 
who will bring order out of the chaos of our idolatry in this unjust world. He is the servant that God delights in. He knows the blueprint, and he will perfectly establish righteousness on earth the way God wants. I want to highlight just four characteristics of his justice from this passage. First, I want us to see the bigness of his justice. Second, the humility of his justice. Third, the gentleness of his justice. And fourth, the persistence of his justice. First, consider the bigness of his justice. Notice how it says in verse 1 that he will bring forth justice to the nations. Family, I know we all believe this here. We know that our hope is not found in the results of November 3rd. Our hope is the one who will bring justice to the nations. I thank God for the freedoms that we have in this country. I thank God for the checks and balances that we have in our government. Uh, But we all know that no system of government on this earth is perfect. Right? There is idolatry woven into the fabric of every society, and this idolatry leads to all kinds of injustice. Since the fall of man, no human effort has been able to create a society where perfect justice reigns and where all things are made right. But here's our hope here. Jesus is the servant who actually sits on the throne of heaven, and he rules the nations. Why do the nations rage, as we heard in Psalm 2? The the kingdoms plot in vain against him. Why do they do such a thing when he's the only ruler who was assassinated and came back from the dead indestructible? And from heaven, he rules in such a way that he is working in and through all things, even earthly power, even if that earthly power presently opposes him. Jesus rules the nations. And every nation is accountable to him. It doesn't matter what evil has been done or covered up. Jesus will bring justice to the nations. And one day we will see more fully how his plan fully worked out. We don't see the big picture now. But he is working all things together for the good of his church and the glory of his name. So even today, Jesus is bringing justice to the nations as he justifies guilty sinners from all nations. He came to establish his kingdom from all nations. He came to bring peace and to unite us to God and to one another in him. So when you look around at local churches near you, uh, and you see just scattered about those from all nations just coming to Jesus, this is a foretaste of what Jesus is actually doing in the world for his glory. So that means we can trust him. There is a bigness to the justice that Jesus brings. But with this bigness, there's also a humility that he brings to his justice. And that's the second aspect. You would expect someone who brings justice to the nations to be kind of, you know, proud and self-promoting. I certainly would. But notice what verse 2 says about the servant's character. It says that he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Now, now that's, that's humility. Jesus is the servant who doesn't seek attention for himself. If you need like an image to kind of wrap your, your mind around this, there was a scene in Matthew's gospel uh, where the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus after he healed a, a man with a withered hand. And in Matthew 12, chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, it says this. Jesus, aware of this, aware of this plot, withdrew from them, from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. And listen to what Matthew says. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And Matthew goes on to quote this text here in Isaiah 42. There is a certain kind of lowliness to Jesus that he did not crave attention He was turning the world upside down with his justice and with his mercy, but he was very low-key about it. Of all the people in the world, Jesus had a right to make a big deal out of everything that he was doing, but he chose not to. 
right? He did justice, but he never went out and promoted himself as the greatest faith healer of all time, right? He, he did justice, but he never was like posting his stats, right? He even told people, don't mention it. Family, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, right? It, it, there is a sense of it's unassuming, but it grows and it has incredible impact. When we do justice, what do we tend to want people to notice? We want people to see that we're doing it, right? We talk about it. We, we use social media and post about it. We want people to see the highlight reels. We want them to catch the sound bites. But the servant was doing justice in the streets of Jerusalem, and he kept a low profile. He was more concerned with doing the will of his father who sent him than getting the praises of men. His justice is a humble justice. That's the second characteristic. But, but the third characteristic of his justice is that it, he was gentle. Notice in verse 3 that he faithfully brings forth justice by not breaking a bruised reed or quenching a burning wick. Now, that's carefulness. So many times when we seek to pursue justice, uh, you know, it's common we, we break people down. Um, we even dehumanize our opponents, or we just run over people. Uh, but the justice that Jesus brings is not like that. He brings justice to the nations, but he doesn't do it at the expense of the little guy. Right? Collateral damage is not an option for Jesus. Right? If the weight of your sin or suffering was breaking you down, Jesus never stomped on you. Right? Do, you, do you remember the woman who was caught in adultery? Uh, they wanted to stone her. They drag her before Jesus, and Jesus, ever perceptive, notices that they did not also bring the man. Right? It's really hard to commit adultery in this way without there being someone else there. And the woman is standing there, and so Jesus sees this. He perceives this woman was a scapegoat. So Jesus did not crush her with the law, although that's what we deserve. But here's what he says, go and sin no more. This is what the gentleness, the tenderness of Jesus' justice looks like. He practiced justice with such wisdom and care that even the most broken and delicate situations could recover under his gracious administration. The servant is gentle in his justice. And finally, we see that the servant is persistent. <laughs> and how? Look at this. Verse 4, it says that he will not grow faint or be discouraged. How many times do we start something, but we don't finish? Right? Many of us, we start things, but we never complete it. Even when it comes to justice, we, we may have a lot of zeal. Uh, maybe we want to start something. Maybe we get something going, but then we get tired. We get weary, right? We lose motivation, Maybe people don't respond in the ways that we would, were expecting. Uh, maybe the work feels overwhelming. But this is what makes the servant stand out. In verse 4, it says that he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on earth. Family, he doesn't give up. Right? He doesn't start the work of doing justice only to let it go undone. He will not stop until the work is done. He's persistent in his justice. He will not stop until he makes all things right. And family, that day, when we see the fullness of that, that day is coming. Jesus is playing the long game. This is a picture of the justice we see in Isaiah 42. And as we continue on in, in Isaiah, uh, we see further snapshots of this servant particularly the, the greatest display of his justice that we see in his suffering at the cross. What is the greatest injustice but that the holy God who has done nothing but right, nothing but good, that we would sin and rebel against him? That is the greatest injustice. It is not what we do to one another, but it's what we have done to God. And at the cross, we see the righteousness of God satisfied. We see the justice of God upheld, that the sinless Son of God goes to the cross bearing our sin. We look at him and we see him scorned, and we're like, man, what did he do? 
<laughs> the reality is he's done nothing but obey the will of the Father. It is for our sin that he's on the cross. This is the ultimate picture of justice as the judgment of God comes down upon his sinless son who is dying in the place of guilty sinners. There is the justice of God. There is the righteousness of God. There is the mercy of God. There is the love of God. All of it coming together by this suffering servant willingly identifying with us and going to the cross to die for guilty sinners that we might be made righteous, just in the sight of a holy God. So behold the servant. He is Jesus Christ. He is the friend of sinners, the gentle and lowly one. He is the one who says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Through Jesus, God is saying, here is my answer for an unjust world. Here is my answer for your rebellion. I love what Ray Ortland says about this. He says, the hope of the world lies in the servant of the Lord, the delight of God, the quiet healer, the man for others who wields the only true power that exists, the power to reorder human civilization, not by bullying, but by suffering, not by imposing demands on us, but by absorbing our sins and miseries into himself. And the furthest coastlands will not dread his approach. They will wait eagerly for his law. This is Jesus. And those who have by faith been justified by this Savior will seek to do justly in the world, which brings us to the final point. Not only is doing justice God's work definitively, but an implication of that is doing justice is our work as the church. You know, some people may legitimately ask the question, is doing justice even something that the church should concern herself with? Uh, maybe it was something for the Old Testament, but now we're in the New Testament. Well, my answer to that is that doing justice is our work because it's a part of our worshipful response to Jesus. And I think the final few verses shine some light on that. Look at verses 5 through 7. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. And he's the father that God is speaking to the servant. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Family, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, we see this here in our text. He is the light who brings salvation and deliverance. And so long as Jesus is the light who shines in the darkness of this world, that means he's in the business of crushing our idols and redeeming us out of the prison and dungeon and darkness of our idolatry. And so long as he is in the business of crushing our idols in this way, he is certainly in the business of transforming us and making us into agents of change on this earth as we worship him. Now, this is what the church is called to do. Part of what it means to worship Jesus is to join him in this mission of spreading light in the midst of darkness. So verse 6 says that Jesus would be a covenant for the people. Well, by grace alone, we have been brought into the family of God under a new covenant and together, we display the beauty of what Jesus is doing in the world as we reflect the light of his righteous character to a watching world. And part of his character is what we see here in Isaiah 42. Now, we will never reflect his character perfectly or even as comprehensively here on this earth. But in some limited way, we participate in displaying this aspect of his character. And we do this in two basic ways, in word and in deed. Word and deed. Family, the church has a message. 
This is what makes us distinct in this world, that, that we have a message, and that message is light that shines in the darkness. We know the truth about Jesus. So we speak the truth about sin, we expose darkness, we bring everything to the light of Scripture, and we point people to the only hope that is in Christ Jesus. The word of the gospel is light. This light sets people free. The gospel shines and opens eyes of the blind. And God has commissioned the church to make Christ known through words. But Jesus also gave us another element that goes alongside of that. He also gave us the light of good deeds. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus says this. You are the light of the world. Okay, Jesus explained this. Well, he says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the small part we play, right? Jesus is the light to the nations. We never get that confused. He is the light, but in him, we become this city on a hill. And we shine the light of Christ as we exercise these good deeds, the fruit of the Spirit to the world, loving our neighbor. People get a sense of the God we worship. It was Martin Luther who said, you know, sometimes we ask, well, does God need my good works? No, he doesn't. Uh, Martin Luther, he said that, you know, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. Right? <laughs> right? That's very practical, very down to earth. Thank you for that clarity, Luther. Um, this is what it means to do justice. We're loving our neighbor, right? This is what Romans is getting at, that we fulfill the law. It's fulfilled in us by the Spirit as we love our neighbor. We do these good works not because they save us, because they can't, right? There is nothing meritorious about the works we do. Um, we do these good works not because God needs them or because um, that's going to earn our way into uh, God's favor in any way, shape, or form, but this is the way that we make the love of God more visible to our neighbor, right? And, and this work can take so many forms. Uh, I jotted down as I was looking at the video uh, this morning about Samaritan's Purse. What an incredible way to do justice and to show the love of Christ in this world. Uh, you could be an elected official. and You're working to give a voice to those who don't have one, and you're working maybe to promote policies uh, that are fair and upright. So amen for praying for those elected officials. You could also be a police officer, um, and you are protecting and you're serving and you're holding fellow officers accountable to their oath. That's one way in which we are shining light and doing justice in this world. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't have to just be like on the street or politics or anything like that. You could also be a mom training up your children in the home to honor God and to live others' focused lives and to devote themselves to Christ. It's like, kind of like a, a delayed time bomb for the future as we're investing in our children uh, and as they take the shape of the truth that we have invested in them and it shapes their whole lives. You could also be working maybe a service job. You could be a barber, you could be a chef, a painter, and you can do justice as you treat everyone fairly, as you willingly use your skill set to serve others in need, maybe even free of charge, as occasion may require, because of what Christ has done freely for you. As a student, you can do justice as you work with integrity. Now, think about that word integrity. It comes from uh, the Latin, which means the, inter the integer, uh, a whole number. Right? It's, you're not one way in one setting and another way in another setting. It's, it's, you're all in. It's, it's full integrity, full clarity, right? That means you are being honest in your work, right? You're doing honest work and you're encouraging others to do the same. That's an aspect of loving your neighbor and doing justice. As a citizen, you can do justice as you work to serve the physical and spiritual needs of people in your community. 
Um, you could even address some of the societal issues that lead to some of those disparities in your community. As a church member, I get very excited about this. You can do justice as you spend time with maybe single moms or help fix someone a meal, support someone who has a financial need, work as a peacemaker in the midst of conflict, right? There are so many opportunities for us to do justice as we love our neighbors, even as church members. Or how about this one? You can do justice even as a child, right? Maybe you, you want to pray for fellow kids, uh, maybe because some sad thing has happened in their life. Maybe their mom or dad was deployed or some sickness has happened to someone they dearly love. And you say, you know, I want to write them a letter. I want to make them some cookies. And and I want to show them that the love of Christ works its way down to even the nuts and bolts of everyday life. That's a way that we love our neighbors and do justice. All right, these are just a few examples, but I hope you get the point. The, the ministry of word and deed is a powerful display of the rule and reign of Christ on earth. And when the church speaks the truth of the gospel and seeks to do justice, not just in big ways, but in small ways, right? in these little ways, we make the love of Christ and his rule and reign more visible to people around us. Now, uh, this, is, this is what I'll say, and I'll end here. The, the, the good news is you don't have to feel the pressure to save the world. I think there's just a lot of pressure in our, especially our social media world, that, that you kind of have to have a continual metric that says, look at what I'm doing and look at how much I'm changing the world and look how much I'm, you know, here's, here's the good news. The pressure's off. You don't have to feel the pressure to save the world. There is real work to do, real justice to work out, but we don't have to despair that everything depends on us because here's the good news, it doesn't. It all depends on the faithfulness of Jesus. But since we know that Jesus' plan can't fail, you know what, we can kind of go all out here knowing that our labor will not be in vain. Confidence that Jesus has worked and is at work frees us to trust him as we seek justice from the highest places of authority to the lowest places of need. Knowing that Jesus will make all things right frees me to love my neighbor even when I don't get attention for it. I can seek justice in little ways, in big ways, and guess what? It's not about me. It's not about how much impact I think I'm making, right? It's not about how things may look. It's not about whether or not my side is winning or not. I'm set free to do what's right because Jesus went before me. He saved me. He loves me, and he goes before me, and he's persistent. He won't give up. His plans won't fail. So even when I get tired, I know that he doesn't get tired. Doing justice is our work, but it's only our work because doing justice is first God's work. Doing justice is our work, but only in the power of Christ who works in us by his spirit. Doing justice would be impossible and it would even be futile if it was not for the fact that Christ is on his throne. Everything is ultimately going his way and he loves us. So the Lord calls us today to participate in what he is doing in this world for his glory. And he has given us his spirit to carry out the mission of gospel preaching and light bearing for his glory. Amen. Amen. I'll pray. Jesus, thank you for this incredible picture that we have of your sovereign, humble, and lowly gentle and persistent justice. Thank you that the great display of justice that we have is at the cross where you made sinners right in God's sight. You have clothed us in a righteousness that is not our own and we stand just before the courts of God because of you. And thank you that through a justified people you are causing us to live justly in this world as we worshipfully respond to your grace. Thank you for freeing us. 
Thank you for redeeming us. And thank you that you are not done with this world and that your promises are as sure as you are risen. So, Lord, I pray that you would affect our hearts, draw our attention to behold the servant um, every day of our lives, that we would remember you and see you and trust you and embrace you by faith so that you might be glorified in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. teaching of how we, by God's grace through Christ, are able to reflect the character of the Father in this world. And we get to do that this coming week. We get to do that this afternoon and tomorrow. What a joyful thing. The, the musicians are going to lead us now in a song of response. We're going to sing the song, Jerusalem, and just meditate on what it teaches us. It's just going to talk to us about the cross and what Christ has accomplished. And then think about what we've just heard from God's word this morning, just the beauty of what God is setting us free to do of living justly in this world. Let's uh, worship the Lord together through song. a frail and lonely man holding up the heavy cross see him walking in Jerusalem on the road to save us Empty tomb here. 
lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne. Sing him in the new Jerusalem. Praise the one who saved us. Praise the one who saved us. Aren't you glad? Amen. So as we remain standing, let's conclude our service this morning by saying our benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.